Welcome everyone. So today we will um, go over an, another review paper of, on RTP Live that we wrote together with Itatiani that we worked on Hiroki Sayama. It was published a couple of years ago, but we worked on it already since 2018. So um, on Tuesday we discussed about RTP Live and we've been discussing about self-organizations and I will bring these two together. Uh, so we will review a bit of each, and then we'll, we'll see how, how they are related to each other. And if, if you want to know more details, I uh, can find them in the paper. Um, so we already said many things about self-organization. Um, examples are flocks of birds, food fishes, insect swarms, herds, crowds, and so on. Uh, and the intuitive notion is that there's no leader, but the global pattern is a result of the interactions of the components. So it's not something that's uh, dictated from the top down or by a single element or by an external source. But um, it is actually related in a way to, to emergence, but that's better not to speak about emergence because that, that could be a, a whole other discussion. But um, there are different ways in which organization, self-organization can be defined. Um, and it's problematic to define it because we need to agree on what is organization, on what is uh, sales, which is uh, another problem that I will deal with towards the end. And also, if we're speaking about self-organizing systems, so what's a system? And we already saw that these are rather arbitrary because we define where are the boundaries of a system. So if we define the boundaries in such a way that the organization takes place inside, then we can say, okay, there's self-organization. But if we draw the boundaries in a bit narrower sense, then we could say, well, it's not self-organization because the organization is coming from outside of a smaller subsystem that we are considering. Um, so, of course, it's relative to the description that we are making. But uh, let's say one, one approach uh, to organization uh, is, to, is to use what has been already used in, in thermodynamics and in information theory. So, precisely, Shannon entropy or Boltzmann, well, Shannon information or Boltzmann gives entropy, which um, it, it's um, one way of defining it's a measure of the homogeneity in a system. Uh, and this is related to the distribution of probabilities in uh, that a system can be. So if a system has, I don't know, a hundred different possible states, and we have the same probability of being in any of these 100 states, probability would be one over 100 for each state, then we say that this system has maximum entropy. And uh, the equation of channel information reflects it, and if you normalize it, you get entropy of one. Uh, so in Shannon information's terms, you say that you have maximum information because the net, next bit that, that you will get, you don't know, uh, you will get system in a, in a one of these 100 states and you don't know which one will it be. And since you have a homogeneous probability, all the information will be given in that next, uh, with bits, it's just two states, not 100 states. But if we are tossing coins, then you have two states, heads or tails, and then if um, it's a random process, the next bit will give you all the information because it doesn't matter how many uh, coins you toss, these don't give you any information about the next uh, coin toss. Uh, well, so, so the next bit will give you maximum information. Do you have a, a non-random well, uh, a deterministic uh, system, basically where probability of being in one state is one, would it be a static system, and the probability of being in all other states is zero, then you have minimum entropy. 
and uh, we could say that this would be maximum organization. Um, in the sense that <coughs> entropy has also been uh, described as a measure of disorder. So in a thermodynamic system, particularly in a, in a gas, uh, you have the same probability of, uh, mo molecules have the same probability of, of in, in any place. Um, then you, you call that maximally disordered. So, so it's similar to random noise. And when you have precise information of, or, or let's say, you know where a particle will be, which you will get, let's say, in a, in a solid, then you will have minimum information. So for example, crystals are more organized than gases because we can see patterns and symmetries and uh, say things that in, in systems with high entropy, you, you don't perceive this organization. So uh, we, we can use the same measure, but in the inverse way and say that the opposite of entropy would be your organization. <laughs> and then just like with all measures of information, or most of measures of information, then we can assume, okay, we, we know whether we are speaking about self organization or, or not. Uh, and, and then we, we're just focusing on organization. So, so here we have a example of, of a very basic abstract system that has four microstates, A1, A2, B1, B2. Uh, and, then, and then at the higher level, we can abstract this into macrostates, which is simply the average of the microstates. So each one would have, um, sorry, there, there would be systems uh, for microsystems or subsystems at the higher level, you have two uh, subsystems. Uh, and then if we, if we have, uh, say, this amount of entropy, we just assume that, I forget which one is lower. So if it increases, uh, then I guess the lighter, yeah, which one is? Um, I guess the entropy is just how homogeneous the colors are. So, for example, here there is less homogeneity, so then entropy increases. And this is just arbitrary to say, okay, we will have these values and then these values. So, this is more homogeneous, so then there's increase of entropy. But then, if we aggregate at the higher level these two subsystems, then we see that this has maximum entropy and then there's an entropy decrease. So this, at the same time, the system self disorganizes and self organizes, but then we can have a, a different aggregation. So instead of aggregating these two, we aggregate these two. And again, we have an entropy increase. Um, so if, if you average these two, you, you will get the same probability for for both microstates. So uh, for the same system, we can see that dep depending how we make the measurement uh, or how we make the partitioning of the subsystems, we can see that the same system is self-organizing and self-disorganizing. So, I mean, this is just a very basic example to show that uh, you, you need to define a frame of reference to speak about self-organization or self-disorganization because the same system can be both. Um, but I mean, this doesn't mean that this is not useful. So, um, I mean, this is for self-organization. I mean, we have shown several applications where we use the idea of self-organization. Uh, and we have argued that it's useful for non-stationary problems because the self-organizing system that we design, its interactions will adapt to unforeseen changes. Therefore, when you have uh, changes in the system, the system will adapt by itself. Um, and then about, about life, well, we, um, biology studies life. Um, it's been doing so for centuries, but we, do, we don't know what life is in the sense that 
we don't have an agreed definition of life. Um, we don't know how to recognize life in other planets. Um, we don't know how life works precisely. I mean, of course, we know a lot about life. <laughs> I mean, all of biology. Uh, that's a huge amount of knowledge. But uh, the idea that there's uh, some transition between non-living and living systems through, through evolution uh, is still unresolved. I mean, the, the origin of life. Um, and there have been several advances, and now the convergence is towards not so much of a non-living slash being strict definition, but towards a more gradual definition of life. Also because we have several examples of um, living systems that they say it's difficult to say whether they are alive or not. Common example is viruses that, um, I mean, they reproduce, but they don't reproduce by themselves. Uh, there are also lots of exceptions. So in school, maybe we were taught some uh, so-called shopping list definitions of life. So okay, living systems are those that grow and reproduce and have metabolism and evolution and DNA or I mean, you, you can make a list of the properties that you observe in living systems, but very probably you will find exceptions to that list. So for example, uh, mules don't reproduce, or uh, most uh, uh, ant individuals in a colony don't reproduce, but they're alive. Um, we could apply the same to many of our cells, that they are not alive. Uh, sorry, they, we say they are alive. But then they cannot reproduce by themselves. But also, we are alive. We cannot reproduce by ourselves. Uh, I mean, no, 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 I'm, I'm not speaking that, uh, that we need two individuals to uh, reproduce, but that we need a society and a culture in order to, to, to be able to survive. So, um, other examples include, um, well, it's difficult. So, for example, is uh, our flowers alive? I mean, because we say that the plants are alive, but then we cut the plant, the flower still blooms. And I mean, because the flower is still close, you cut it, you put it in water. It is, is it still alive? Well, yes, but you know, it will die. But at the end, we will all die. So, where, where? When did the flower die? Uh, and this is also um, even an ethical question because uh, how do you decide that human died? Because you can have uh, patients that they have no brain -like activity, uh, but everything else is working more or less with life support. So are they alive or not? Uh, and this goes into questions of euthanasia. Uh, or also, when do you declare someone clinically dead? Uh, also with examples that people are clinically dead, but then they can be brought back to life with RCP or, or whatever, no? So, um, another problematic discussion is uh, about when do we start our lives? Uh, and of course, this is related to, to abortion. Uh, when is it legally or ethically permissible to, to perform abortions? Um, and, and also, we have examples of uh, other living systems that it's difficult to categorize whether they're alive or not. So for example, spores or, or seeds, um, are they alive or not? I mean, because they don't really have a metabolism, but we can say that they are in a dormant state. Because given the right conditions, the seeds can sprout, and then you have a living plant or the spores uh, in the same way. So when, when they're in these dormant states, are they alive or not? We could say no, but maybe they have potential to live if the right conditions um, arise. And then you also have these examples of cryptobiosis. Uh, which are systems that seem not to be alive, but they are alive. 
or potential life. So examples are uh, tardigrades or water bears. There are these microscopic animals, eight legs. Uh, some people find them cute and some people find them, <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, they're like tardigrade lovers and tardigrade haters. <laughs> um, or uh, ticks are also able to be in a semi-hibernating dormant state, uh, just feeding on bacteria from the air while they wait. So they're a bit like Zulu, uh, lying somewhere with uh, almost no metabolism. And then when they feel uh, warm blood approaching, then they kind of wake up from their slumber and uh, they go and start sucking blood to, to, to feed themselves. And um, another example of cryptobiosis are these uh, Arctic frogs that in winter basically freeze over. They have antifreeze in their blood so that the crystals don't pierce their cells. Um, so they, they are also called frog sickles. Um, and for all winter, they remain frozen. And if you look at it, it doesn't have metabolism. It doesn't reproduce. It's, is it dead? Well, not quite because spring comes, it melts, and it revives. So it's, it's difficult to, to distinguish when life begins, when it ends, and or what does it entail. So uh, artificial life um, try to <laughs> to address some of these questions. Uh, John von Neumann was uh, perhaps the first one to to address the question of reproduction uh, formally. So he put the question, can a machine self-reproduce? And he defines a automata to address this. Uh, Chris Langton uh, proposed these loops that have his name uh, as a simplification of um, self-reproducing system. So it's another cellular automata, but much simpler than von Neumann's and much smaller where you have these loops that uh, they have a fixed program and say they make copies of for themselves. Um, <coughs> and I mean, we, we already saw more or less what artificial life tries to do, try to understand life by building it. So it's also known as the synthetic method, uh, but also to understand life to build artificial systems that have the properties of biological systems like adaptivity and learning and evolution and so on. Um, so we, we can divide uh, artificial life in soft, hard, and wet. So first one is in, in software. Um, and uh, this is the most common or popular artificial life because it's the easiest one to make. We already saw the game of life, which uh, has an interesting story. Um, in, the, in this biography of John Point Neumann, they speak about uh, John Conway and students in the late 60s. Um, I, I forget where it was, where New York, University, well, some university in the, in the Northeast, but in the cafeteria, they kind of gather lots of go boards and stick them to each other. And they were with uh, manually uh, playing the game. Uh, and like that, they kind of zoom in into the rules that would produce interesting patterns. And once they had decided, one student just noticed, hey, this, this one is moving. And, and that's how they discovered gliders. and. Then in 1970, uh, in Scientific American, uh, well, Gardner had a popular column and he mentioned, uh, well, he presented the game of life. And then it became very popular. And also because there was a challenge to find uh, a pattern that would produce gliders. And uh, Cosper from MIT with his students, they found the first gun which is now known as the Gosper gun. But anyway, just to review the, the very simple rules of uh, the game of life, another cellular automata, but now 
just two states. Zero, the cell is dead, one cell is alive, and then you count the uh, living neighbors from its, um, uh, what's called the Moore neighborhood, the Ponoima neighborhood is just these four. Uh, so you count also the corners, um, and if you have too many neighbors, then there's not enough resources, you die. If you have too few, you get cold or sad or whatever, and you also die. So in order to remain alive, you need two or three neighbors. It could be these two or these three, it doesn't matter, so the position. And to, to have uh, a verse, you need to have exactly three living cells around a, a dead one, and then this one uh, is born. <coughs> the update is made synchronously, meaning that you have two copies, let's say T, and t plus one, and then you make all the calculations uh, without changing t. So let's say you count how many, yeah, let, let's assume this one. So uh, this one will die in the next step. So you update it to zero. But then when you calculate this, you still check on this so that you don't say, oh, this is zero, then it doesn't change because then you don't know which one to update first. Um, so yeah, that's just known as synchronous updating. And once you update all of this, you copy this to T, and then you calculate again T plus one. So, let's say with, with one cell or two cells, they die. With three cells, you have an oscillator. Uh, with four cells, you have a beehive, you have another cell. And Reproduces, you have another cell. And then you have this pattern. And then there are some stable structures like the, these blocks or this one. Here you see the gliders, these spaceships and gliders of different sizes and speeds move through space and of course movement is not encoded in the, in the rules but then we say that these emerge out of the interactions of, of cells you can also say that <coughs> these patterns are self-organizing because there's no rule saying the spaceship will move like this and here you have some spaceship that generate gliders which they collide and then they build some gospel guns which shoot gliders so you have um, structures that generate structures that generate structures that generate structures. And we already saw that you can build the game of life inside the game of life. So I have some spaceships that are produced by some spaceship guns. Then they collide and annihilate each other. And there's some circuitry that's computing the game of life at a different scale. And it was shown that you can also build a universal Turing machine. <coughs> and of course, if you can compute any computable function, you should be, in theory, able to compute life within life. Of course, this becomes recursive. Um, the, this nice example of, of the voids that uh, we already saw uh, the beginning of the course, but uh, I think like with half a million individuals. And uh, what we, people from the lab of Takashi Kagame at the University of Tokyo found is that when you reach these scales, uh, you start having these uh, kind of membranes, or uh, I don't know how to call them, but these 
structures, uh, I mean, we, we, knew, we knew that void self-organizing disrupts, but these stable structures that appear at very high scales, we need to know about them. Uh, only when they began making these huge simulations, they, they found that you have these more or less stable uh, structures um, in, in this system as well. So, I mean, in a similar way, many people speculate that uh, in, in the game of life, you can have more complex behavior, just that you would need um, even greater sizes of, uh, <coughs> of worlds to, to simulate and observe them. Uh, and this is also an idea that Stephen Wolfram has put forward, especially in a uh, physics project where they explore um, <coughs> this computational universe, as he calls it, which is a space of different possible rules, transition tables, and so on. Uh, and they're trying to find like the basic rules that reproduce the laws of physics that we have in our universe. And they have some very interesting advances. Um, but also the question is how how big do you need your simulation to be in order to reproduce? Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not speaking about culture, but just molecules. So it seems that this might explode computationally and even with uh, supercomputers who, who won't be able to reach, uh, let's say chemistry in such simulations. But anyway, there's huge potential for software simulations. We, we have also stressed the relevance um, of computers to study complex systems because simply there's no other way to study, say, half a million elements, even if they have simple interactions or, or the game of life is very simple. Um, you, you need a tools uh, as Heinz Bagels. Uh, refer to them the telescopes for complexity, where you basically they, they do all the calculations for us. So the um, hard artificial life refers to robotics. Uh, <coughs> on Tuesday, we spoke a bit about this as well. Um, one example is uh, from the group of Radhik and Akpal in Harvard. Um, with these little kilobots, um, they're tiny little things that vibrate and that, like that they move. And uh, so they, they don't have a central plan to form this star, but with local rules, they can uh, find their place in, in, in a complex pattern. Um, these type of studies, are related to embryogenesis or development, where the question arises, well, if we all started from a single cell, how the cell uh, divided and then further cells differentiate in order to form uh, multicellular animals in a reliable way. And uh, I mean, these questions from epigenetics have been also addressed. Um, well, there's a whole subfield known as epigenetic robotics uh, and precisely they use robots to try to <coughs> study uh, epigenesis with a um, uh, synthetic approach. Uh, another example from the group of Tamas Fixek in Budapest, uh, it's the um, um, I forget how they name the robots, but they're basically quadcopters. And uh, say they self-organize for formations. They, they had a performance called Dan Dancing with Drones or something like that. And uh, it was a hybrid between dancers and drones uh, for some art festival. I forget which one. And we also did um, here in simulation, but it's like uh, assuming the, the same drones 
using self organization to coordinate an intersection in three dimensions, uh, similar to what we did for traffic lights. But here you don't need a traffic light, you just need to avoid them crashing. And if, let's say, the density is too high, then principle you can just use the extra dimension to reduce the conflict. So, uh, the wet artificial life deals with uh, chemical reactions. So, these protocells are also known as active droplets. They divide and move. Uh, and it's just chemical reactions. Um, they're more, more or less well understood. Let's say how, how they work thermodynamically, or why they move. Um, and I mean, it's very interesting, you know, uh, this seems like a living system, but it's just chemical reactions. So when the chemical reactions stop and the living system begins, um, and then some people say, well, only when you have genetic information, then you have life. But of course, you also require this to have life because you, don't, you can't transmit genetic information without this. Um, actually, um, about 18 years ago, there was a European project uh, called Base or Pace in, in Italian, um, which was something about protocells. Uh, and um, the idea was that already they had uh, built, well, some people call these droplets protocells, so that they had membranes. And then, the, well, the, the, the idea was that uh, uh, protocell that we would consider alive, it would have a membrane, a metabolism, and uh, information transmission. And let's say variation, um, so so that would give you reproduction. So very quickly they were able to make membranes. Well, they, they were made already uh, by then by uh, by different groups, uh, also my cells. Um, then they made metabolism, but it was like in a um, uh, I forget the name of this thing, but it's like uh, like little micro containers where the say metabolism would would occur. And then they also had information, let's say a specific way of, of having information, and and they were like, well, we just need to put these three together. So maybe next year we'll already have living protocell. Uh, and it's been almost twenty years. And, <laughs> uh, that hasn't happened. And uh, one of the members of this project was Ricardo Soler from uh, Universidad Pompeo Fabra. Uh, and I met him at a meeting in Atlanta uh, three, four years ago, just before the pandemic. Uh, and I reminded him that, I mean, he was part of this project. But, uh, and I reminded him, oh, what do you think now, 15 years later, uh, about your claims that we'll have living protocells in a year? Uh, and it's 15 years and we still don't have it. And he told, yeah, yeah, well, I, I was too optimistic. Um, back in that time, I was telling every year that it was one year ahead. And uh, I mean, many people make su such predictions like we will have real artificial intelligence, whatever that means in whatever time. And then this always, <laughs> always moves up. So, uh, Another window like that is for autonomous vehicles, that they are like five years ahead, and they've been like five years ahead for 15 years. <laughs> it's always five years ahead. So, uh, yeah, let's say that there are further challenges to integrating these systems together. But some other advances uh, by groups in, in Prague and in Trento have been studying uh, these uh, droplets that they change shape. And I mean, it's just interesting behavior, but uh, it's it's a very slow process because imagine the space of all possible chemical reactions. It's just huge and it explodes immensely. 
So it's uh, chemistry. Until recently, it was precisely people. Oh, what if we change the concentration of this? And what if we, instead of using sulfuric acid, we use sulfuric acid or whatever? Uh, there, there are so many options, uh, and, and it's basically trial and error and lots of luck. But um, and also depending on the temperature, you might get different results, and depending on many many other factors. So uh, a group in uh, Hmm, just forgot his name. Um, I forgot whether is he, is he in Edinburgh? Well, somewhere in the UK, I, I think in Scotland. Um, they, they built a, a robot that automatizes the exploration of the chemical space. So basically, uh, just like we do simulations and we explore the space of parameters, they program a robot and kind of mixes different ingredients, different concentrations, different conditions. And then with a camera, uh, they kind of process whether something interesting occurs. Um, like that, they can explore systematically chemical space, which is still very slow, but that's already a major step in automatizing operation of these type of systems. Um, so yeah, it's, it's slow, but it's interesting, and um, we'll, we'll see whether we, they find something, uh, whether there's a, a breakthrough. Yeah. Um, so this paper, uh, with Hiroki and Justin and Vito, we, we propose a classification depending on different types of self-organization. So if the self-organization is well, we call it internal, basically, whether the system that we are studying uh, has the self-organization inside, meaning that the interactions occur within the system, we call it internal and external if um, these interactions are with the agents or elements of the system and, and its environment. Um, and, and then we can have direct, if uh, interactions or indirect interactions, of course, if it's internal, the interactions are always direct. But external, you can have direct interactions and indirect interactions, which would be stigmergic, let's just say, uh, interactions through the environment. So examples of internal self-organization in soft day life, uh, pattern formations, or automata, artificial neural networks, and many others. In, for hard artificial life, we have self-modeling robots like uh, those of uh, Josh Bongard, swarm bots from the group of Marco Dorigo in Brussels, and wet life protocols and active droplets, just the ones I mentioned. So here, the self-organization will go inside the robots, inside the protocells, and yeah, inside simulation. Uh, and then for external, Let's say we have voids or swarm chemistry that basically you have lots of agents and then they self organize the interactions. Uh, have also lots of examples of groups of robots that self organize. And with wet a life, xenobots would be an example. And also there are some predator protocells that have been explored. And then with indirect or stigmatic interactions, so to have and colonial optimization that we, we saw. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, the Thermis project, which uh, is inspired by thermites uh, for self organizing building of structures. Um, so, I mean, you have these robots that grab pieces and then they drop them uh, so they don't communicate directly, but through the environment they perceive and they, they build structures just like thermites build their mounds without having a central plan on, on how they should look like. And for the wet lives, there are some examples of slime mode machines and also some work exploring collective behavior of droplets. So, uh, I mean, there are similarities, but also differences between these. So perhaps this classification can be useful to, to see uh, the different aspects. 
And like looking at all the different self uh, uh, examples of self organization in artificial life, we can try to identify different mechanisms that uh, facilitate or promote self organization. And I mean, we don't have like an established uh, guidelines of building self organization, nor in artificial life, nor anywhere else. But it seems we can start moving towards uh, something like design patterns in, in architecture or, or programming, uh, where we notice the relevance of interactions and we learn how to uh, identify positive and negative interactions and how can we regulate this through mediators. Um, and, and this is something that the more self organizing systems that we build and study, we will better understand what are the commonalities between interactions that we want to um, achieve. Um, and there's another sub community, uh, well, there's International Society of Guided Self Organization. Uh, and actually, the next conference will be in New Zealand in December. So the call for papers will be soon. Um, of course, we, I, I think New Zealand already opened its borders. I'm not sure. I think they did. But yeah, hopefully they, they won't close again. Um, there are also behavioral patterns that, say, in, from ethology have been identified, but then we can also apply them to a life. Um, on Tuesday, we also mentioned about information theory. How can it be useful uh, for artificial life in general, but in particular for self-organization in artificial life, whether uh, we should suppress information or enhance information, and how can this regulate, how this information regulate interactions, so this uh, can go hand in hand. And also how different feedback loops, whether positive or negative, uh, can be useful to promote self-organization in, in artificial life systems, which, I mean, this has been studied from cybernetics, as, as we mentioned at the beginning of the course, but, uh, Within the context of self-organization, I think there's still room for exploration on what's the role of different feedback loops in self-organizing self systems. And um, <coughs> living technology can be defined as that technology that exhibits properties of living systems. So um, the people who coined this term uh, they distinguish between first order living technology and second order living technology. So first order living technology would be that which is alive and uh, farm animals would be one example of living technology. But let's say they are also envisioning a future where we can design living systems that uh, they will be used for other purposes as well. Uh, and second order living technologies that which uses living systems as parts of that <coughs> technology. So in that sense, all socio-technical systems or, or cyber physical system, or oh, no, no, cyber social systems <coughs> or socio-technical systems, basically humans and machines, they would be second order living technology because humans are part of that technology. Um, so for both first order and second order living technology, um, self-organization can be uh, used as a method or approach to face complexity, it gives us adaptability, robustness, and fragility. And also uh, another community more inclined towards engineering, uh, they, they have been organizing um, conferences on uh, I think they're called adaptive and self organizing systems, a SOS or something like that. Um, and there's also another community called EvoStar, which uh, I mean, they, they both 
speak about self-start systems, basically self-reconfiguration, self-healing, self-management, self-assembly, and self-whatever you want, that's self-start. So self-organization can be seen as a general case of each of these uh, more particular self-something systems, which um, say they're interesting in their own uh, sense. And if we understand more about self-organization, it's generally a way we can contribute to all of this. But also, if we understand better these particular cases of self-star systems, in principle, some of these insights could be generalized to better understand self-organization as well. And um, I mean, several methodologies have been proposed to, to design self-organizing systems. Actually, it, it seems it was uh, in the air because that was basically my, my PhD thesis uh, was defended in 2007. But at the time, there were several other methodologies that were being proposed just before, just after. Uh, but like in the last 15 years, <laughs> there have been any, any other uh, approaches. Perhaps we, we uh, say there, there was like a niche, and we occupied it, and then that's it. <laughs> but um, yeah, there, there's more room for improvement. <clears throat> and we already have mentioned about examples of um, how to design self-organization, which is also related to, to guided self-organization. How can we build systems that self-organize so that through the self-organization they perform as we want the systems to do? And there are several open questions. How can we program self-organization if this is possible? Because um, this might be related to what we have already spoken about of computational irreducibility. It says that if self-organization is based on interactions, then if these interactions are all information, predictability is limited. So uh, yeah, this will be related to to the limits of prediction of self-organization. I, I think they're also related to the limits of prediction in complexity, which had to do with computational irreducibility. So, uh, I mean, this, this is, um, my intuition is that there are limits of prediction. They have still to be framed properly, but also there are ways to, let's say, in particular cases, go beyond those limits. So just like with complex systems, if you can run a simulation that uh, goes faster than real time, then you could predict the future just because you are simulating it faster than it occurs. Um, but uh, I mean, it will be for specific cases. Uh, and then another open question we, we, we briefly mentioned, but it's in the article that we discussed uh, last Tuesday about the open problems in a life. So there are this, this list of 14 problems uh, that was made at, around the turn of the century. So how can self-organization contribute to some of these problems? And also whether there are some theoretical and practical limits of self-organization, because we know that self-organization is not always the best case, and uh, perhaps uh, public health measures are a good example of when self-organization is not the best choice, in the sense that some countries have recently decided to let people choose uh, their protection. Like, okay, if you want to wear a face mask, you do it, and if you don't, you don't. If you want to get vaccinated, good for you. And if you don't, uh, don't worry, we'll, the healthcare system will pay the burden. And uh, the problem is that in many cases, just with a few individuals that don't align or, or don't do their job, uh, that can create several problems like in a pandemic. Or That's also <coughs> an explanation of why we have institutions like the police. It's not, it's not because the majority of the population will be criminal if you remove the police. It's just a minority, but let's say the, in order to prevent 
the potential damage of a minority of people that don't follow certain rules, then you, we have made institutions that try to enforce those rules. Um, and if you wouldn't have these top-down uh, impositions, we could call them, or <laughs> restrictions to our freedom, however you want to call them, um, then society would be uh, more chaotic, as as we've seen, say, in the Wild West, for example, or uh, take usually in countries that don't have these restrictions, then few people uh, have a bit less scruples and more strengths or are more violent, then they take over. And that's how in many countries, extremist minorities take over the country. So we have seen that in Afghanistan, we have seen that in Iran, um, and I hope we won't see it in Mexico, <laughs> but uh, there, there's all the risk. Huh? Uh, I mean, uh, for the next elections, people are speaking like, oh, who will be the candidate of Morena, the current governing party, and who will be candidate or candidates from the opposition. But <clears throat> still people are not considering that the organized crime can increase its influence in, in politics, uh, in like party of the Sinaloa cartel, for example. <laughs> and I don't know how many votes they would get, but um, in Colombia it happened, like the, the uh, FARCs became institutionalized. And uh, I mean, of course, it's a very different context because, uh, well, <laughs> we're already going into a different direction. I'm just saying that uh, self-organization is not a panacea and we should solve everything with self-organization. Um, Actually, there's another paper where, we, where I try to, to define when it's preferable to have a top-down control or a distributed control or a self organization control, um, which, which we can discuss in future class. So another open question, how can the understanding of self-organization and life benefit other disciplines, mainly biology? So if we understand self-organization in artificial life, Maybe we can use this understanding uh, for understanding better biological life. And um, an another topic that uh, could be a whole other talk is uh, downward causation. Um, so downward causation, it's the idea that macroscopic properties influence microscopic well, the, the microscopic scales influence microscopic scale. And reductionists don't believe that downward causation exists. Uh, well, in physics, we are taught that there is no downward causation, and all the explanations, or most explanations in physics, uh, <coughs> try to, to frame systems in terms of upward causation. And, and you could say, well, yeah, just like in the game of life, there is no number of causation. You have emerging properties, yes, and um, people. I mean, it will be a rough way of differentiating weak emergence and strong emergence. So people, in in general terms, because there are subtle differences, uh, we could say that weak emergence is when you observe a pattern, like a glider, that uh, it's a it's a property that it's not present in the elements of a system, so cells don't move, gliders move, that's weakly emergent property. But to have strong emergence, then you would need downward causation, meaning that the glider, in, in the context of the game of life, changes the rules of the cells, and then because of the glider, you will have different rules at the, at the cell level. And uh, for some reasons, for CCC, for physicists, this, this is a problematic idea and also has spurred many debates in cognitive science. So the idea that consciousness uh, can be explained from a bottom-up perspective or not, 
I mean, I wouldn't say it's reduced to the problem of downward causation, but it's related to, to, to it in the sense that um, some people believe that we can explain everything uh, uh, in terms of neurons uh, or even lower scales. And um, then consciousness is just a new phenomenon. Um, I don't know. I, I think downward causation is real. Um, if I move my hand like this, then let's say the atoms in my hand are not violating the laws of physics. But if we look at laws of physics uh, uh, of all my hand, we uh, kind of map all the atoms, molecules, subatomic particles at the level you wish. And you have all the rules, all the under conditions, you will not be able to predict that I will move my hand like that. Um, <coughs> why? Because the, let's say, the impulse of my uh, hand movement uh, it, it, it's not that it's like something spooky, but it's something that is not described at the scale of atoms, but let's say at the, at the linguistic scale, uh, and that is justified by the context we are in. And we wouldn't be able to explain it or predict it without considering higher level structures like language, like the university, like the internet. And you cannot include all of those in your simulation. <laughs> At the atomic level, um, so the, therefore I, I, I would say that our position is real. Uh, we also mentioned the example of money, where uh, say money is not material but it has causal influence in matter and energy. Um, like you have a mountain again, you can predict uh, the future of its particles, but not that some humans will come and extract some resources from that mountain uh, without the concept of money, and money cannot be reduced to physics. Um, so anyway, th there's some work that we've done on our conversation with random bullet networks, actually. So we proposed uh, two scales where <coughs> At the lower scale, you have lots of random bullet networks, and then the majority value of these downward, uh, lower scale neural networks and random bullet networks um, define the state of the higher scale nodes. So suppose we have 20 higher scale nodes, the lower scale, this would be 20 random bullet networks. Each, let's say, has 10 nodes, uh, 11 nodes, so that's, uh, there's, there are no ties, and then we generate randomly, uh, and then for some time we run the lower scale, and then when it's time to run the higher scale, uh, let's say the majority of zeros or ones at the lower scale will determine the value of the higher scale, uh, so that will give us our state of the higher scale, and then we run the higher scale one time step, uh, and some ones and zeros will change some want, and, but then we impose those states in all of the nodes so at the lower scale. So if in the first node, higher scale, it was one, all the nodes of the micro scale network of node one will be one. If this node two it was zero, all the nodes lower scale will be zero, and so like, uh, and like that. Uh, and uh, we explore the properties of, of these networks with different in different conditions. And for some properties, it doesn't, let's say this imposition from the higher scale to lower scale doesn't make a difference. And for some others it does. So we could argue that there is some downward causation for some of the properties, not for everything. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's something that's, that remains an open question and would be interesting to, to study with with computational methods to define better what can we understand by by downward causation, um, and I don't know maybe this also related to limits of formal systems, limits of artificial intelligence, and so on, uh, in the sense that 
as we have them now, um, when you introduce downward position, it might be similar to uh, being able to change the axioms of a system. And if you allow that, then you cannot really prove something because you need the axioms to be fixed. Um, but it's something that has to be explored further. So um, just to finish, I want to mention briefly something I presented last year at the a live conference, um, which, I mean, you, if you search for the title, you can find it, uh, or maybe I also paste it in the, in the classroom. Um, so yeah, the, the full title is on the scales of sales, selves, information life and Buddhist philosophy. So um, we can assume that living systems are selves in the sense that they have a boundary. And then where do you do the boundary? And then what happens when you observe the same system at different scales? And then I mentioned different structural, temporal, and informational scales and how uh, I mean, we can make different descriptions of different scales and also make different decisions. Um, because, let's say, the naive idea would be that the self is the individual, but then, uh, I mean, I already mentioned where, what would be the individual? Is it the cell? Is it the multicellular organism? Is it the society? Is it the biosphere? And so on. <laughs> in terms of Buddhist philosophy, self is an illusion uh, or not real, because for Buddhist philosophy, for something to be real, it cannot change. Uh, so basically, if you if you die, <laughs> then you're, you're not real, <laughs> because uh, you didn't exist. And now you are here, but then you won't exist, or and we are changing constantly. So how can you define that you exist if there's nothing to grasp. I mean, we're, we're changing constantly. Um, we are ephemeral. Um, and then Buddhist philosophy focuses on things that are permanent according to that definition, that don't change. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, that goes into more philosophical directions. And if you're interested, I'll, I'll, I'll paste the link in, in the classroom. But yeah, let's better use the time we have left for questions and comments or complaints. Yeah, one. Um, in order to completely describe or define uh, self organization. We should think in creating a, some kind of um, unit of measure and, uh, and, uh, and, and scale and to compare to which system is more self uh, organized than others. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, Shannon information, it's a unitless measure. And since we have used Shannon information as a proxy for organization, then there doesn't have units. But that doesn't mean that we cannot come up with a definition of organization that does have units. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, yeah, I, I don't, well, you can measure information in terms of bits. But yeah, entropy, since it's statistical, it's like some of probabilities. Well, you, you, you take probabilities and then you make calculations. And uh, I guess the same applies for all entropies and all the information of different flavors. <coughs> so I don't know whether the same would apply for organization or self organization that it's a unitless measure. If we uh, focus on uh, on the probability distribution. If we come up with a different notion of organization, then might have some units. 
and then we may be able to compare uh, different systems. But <clears throat> from from what I've seen since many of these comparisons are arbitrary, um, yeah, that makes it difficult to come up with uh, units. Um, yeah, because at, at the end, information and organization is not about say how many elements you have. That would be yeah. If you count them, then you can put a unit or whatever. Uh, matter or energy, uh, but, uh, how they are arranged. So it's a drawback, but also an advantage because you can apply it to everything. So because in principle you can arrange everything in different ways and you can calculate probabilities for everything. Thank you. On, online or, or on the chat? Anyone would like to comment? We also accept jokes, only if they are politically incorrect. No. <laughs> 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 don't, don't worry, it will be on YouTube, so people will, will be able to judge you for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> no, I prefer no. <laughs> Only to be in YouTube is <laughs> maybe it's gonna be interesting. <laughs> but I see well, some of the clouds. <laughs> Well, if not, then I'll see you next Tuesday and um, try to advance with your with your projects, not to leave them for the last weeks, because very probably you you'll have other projects from other courses. So if you can advance, then go, go ahead. And if you have questions, send me an email or for next class we can start with your questions. Okay, so have a great weekend. Creo que le dejaron una pregunta. No, no te preocupes, era, era yo solamente porque me, me estoy acercando un montón con algunas cosas de Python que no estoy acostumbrado y creo que le debería preguntar un par de cosas de, de teoría de, de redes que no me salen. La verdad es que me estoy volviendo un poco loco con el proyecto. Sí, por correo está bien. <ríe> no hablamos en estos días. Igualmente, hasta luego. Hasta luego. Bueno, gracias, hasta luego. Bueno, este, disculpe, tengo una pregunta, profesor. Bueno, ¿se me escucha? Sí. Ah, este, eh, quería saber si de casualidad no tiene alguna noción de algún paper o, o lectura que me pueda guiar este, para saber cómo puedo determinar si existe un atractor en, en, un, este, en una teoría, un atractor de cualquier tipo extraño, de punto fijo, solo quiero saber si existe alguna especie de prueba. Eh, bueno, en sistemas dinámicos se define un atractor como el subconjunto del espacio de estados que... Eh, eh, a, a donde la dinámica converge. Entonces, hay sistemas que no convergen a ningún subconjunto de estados o que tardan una infinidad. Entonces, se dice que se caen en el transiente. El transiente son los estados intermedios antes de que llegas a un atractor. Eh, sí. Tal vez la manera, el tipo de sistemas más 
fáciles de estudiar estos son los sistemas eh, dinámicos discretos, como autómatas celulares, redes booleanas. Tienes un número finito de estados, eh, el tiempo también es discreto eh, y el espacio también es discreto. Eh, entonces, eh, pues, digamos, es muy fácil ah, y, y también si son deterministas. Es la tercera, ¿no? Entonces, si tienes espacio discreto, tiempo discreto y determinismo, es como que la, la versión más fácil de, de estudiar. Eh, hay, hay por ahí algunos artículos de Andy Wench. Eh, si buscas discrete dynamical systems, um, Andy Wench o Andrew Wench, eh, W-U-E-N-S-C-H-E. Eh, he encontrado lo que hizo pues creo que ya desde el siglo pasado pero sigue siendo muy válido entonces o, o, o también de 2004 hay, hice una introducción a, a redes booleanas aleatorias eh, Introduction to Random Boolean Networks si lo buscas está por ahí en el archive y, y ahí también se explica eh, pues estos casos de, de los sistemas dinámicos discretos entonces eh, pues ahí se dividen los estados en jardines del Edén, que son los que llegan solo por condiciones iniciales, los transientes, que son los que te llevan un atractor, y los atractores, que es donde la dinámica se queda. Entonces, básicamente, un atractor es aquel... O sea, si tienes un sistema determinista dinámico discreto, eh, si repites un estado, ese estado es parte del atractor. Y si no lo repites, es que es transiente. Eh, y este, de y, casualidad, ¿no hay algo así como una forma, como, un, como una receta como para saber encontrar ese atractor? Es, para, para estos sistemas dinámicos, así, si, si repites un estado, ya sabes que ya llegaste a un atractor. Y, eh, porque es determinista. Pero cuando no tienes determinismo, entonces puedes tener lo que se conoce como atractores flojos, en inglés, loose attractors. Eh, porque, con, digamos, en un sistema determinista discreto, solo tienes un sucesor. O sea, el futuro solo es uno. Que si es el mismo estado, pues ya te quedaste en un, en un estado estático. Y ese estado es atractor. Eh, pero, digamos, solo puedes salir de un atractor con una perturbación. Si no hay perturbación, pues ya sabes que siempre te, te, te vas a quedar en ese atractor. Eh, si tienes no determinismo, entonces eh, cada estado puede tener más de un sucesor. O sea, puedes estar en un estado e irte para acá o para allá. Entonces, eso hace que pueda haber un subconjunto que sea atractor, pero luego te saca de ese atractor eh, alguna condición que, que no has explorado. Entonces, eh, estos atractores flojos son más difíciles de explorar porque pues, como que tendrías que hacer muchas más simulaciones para ver si te puedes salir de un atractor o no. Pero aún así, eh, sí se sabe que normalmente hay un subconjunto de estados que, que capturan la dinámica y aunque no sea determinista y no sabes exactamente en qué estado vayas a estar, lo mismo sucede con los atractores extraños o fractales, eh, pues te quedas en ese subconjunto de estados. Ya dentro de ese atractor, quién sabe dónde estés. Pero no vas a salirte fácilmente o, o en algunos casos se puede demostrar que no te vas a salir. Eh, entonces, eh, como que una receta para encontrar atractores que es, digamos, un poco arbitraria porque depende de qué tanto observas un sistema y a qué escala lo observas, es eh, pues básicamente decir el conjunto de estados que atrapa la dinámica. O en otras palabras, si calculas la probabilidad de que un sistema esté en un estado y calculas la, la probabilidad para distintos estados, pues los que tengan las probabilidades mayores, pues esos van a ser tus atractores. Y ahí, eso lo puedes aplicar para cualquier tipo de sistema, aunque sea no determinista y caótico y continuo. Eh, 
pues, pues va a haber regiones del espacio donde el sistema va, va a estar más, con una mayor probabilidad que otros. Y, y eso los puede llamar atractor, eh, porque ahí es a donde tiende la dinámica del sistema. Pero o sea, en general, pues tienes tu espacio de estados, ya sea discreto o continuo, y va a haber partes de ese espacio donde el sistema va a estar con mayor probabilidad y esos los llamas atractores. Y citando a Ashby, pues uno puede decir que el sistema se autoorganiza hacia esos atractores. Simplemente porque son los estados más probables, ¿no? Entonces es una tautología. Ah, uh, ok. Sí, es que, bueno, hago un estudio este, de la entropía y, bueno, siempre resulta que hay una reducción de entropía. Entonces, uh -huh. este, bueno, me da un me da una noción de que hay una... Bueno, no lo puedo llamar autoorganización porque hay una inteligencia detrás, pero sí siempre hay un este hay una reducción de entropía, entonces este pues sí me da como que el, la impresión de que hay un atractor ahí, entonces no, no encuentro la forma de, de decir que sí hay un... Eh... Pues, si hay una reducción de entropía, eso quiere decir que algunos estados son más probables que otros. Entonces, digo, no sé si tenga sentido usar la palabra atractor o no, pero lo puedes decir tal cual. Ah, pues estos estados son más probables que estos. Y, y ya. Ok. Bueno, gracias. Este, no sé si le pueda mandar un correo para que me pueda repetir bien los nombres. Es que no sí, alcanza sí. a escribirlos. Sí, y uh, Anayat, si, si me puedes enviar correo también, por favor, va a ser más seguro que, que conteste. 